All right, we are back. Um, got some lunch, uh, put it around the house a little bit, thought a little bit about stuff, where I want to move forward. Um, I do actually think that it's about time to start extracting out, probably not this, but um, no, both of these actually. So there's two two things that are happening here. Caring about the comment type is not actually something that we're doing right now, and handling default lines, or handling not just default lines, but multiple line types is also another thing that we're not doing right now. Um, so quick reminder of what multiple line types look like are these little hash things here and also these at symbols. And there's a couple of other ideas I have possibly about line types. Um, I want that to be something that's expandable that I can sort of like improve on as, as we go. Um, there's also multiple comment or block types, which is right now I've only showed the star, but the two that I'm thinking about are this for parsing out a source, and this for appending. Um, and I'll show you what those look like, but to show you what they look like, I actually want to jump over to Distilled, uh, which is another library that I look at, and I wanna show what the unit tests look like and sort of give a demonstration of what I'm eventually aiming for, which is a sort of more stateful parsing of, of these blocks. So let's jump into distilled. All right, let's just pull up pretty much any of these. Let's pull up then. Okay, so what I have for distilled, is I have a whole bunch of tests that I've wrapped in a special wrapper that allows me to use console statements as assertions. Um, and do some fun asynchronous stuff with them. The point is, I want these to be demos on the Distilled website, and I want people to be able to run that code and change that code on the fly. Like, I want the test suite to be in itself a type of documentation. Um, so that means what I need to be able to do is I need to be able to get this source code out and onto the web page, and I also need to sort of have annotations and label these in some way. So what that might look like if I had documentation is something like this. So first of all, let's stick a block comment up here and give this a label like, um, uh, let's, let's make a couple of sections actually, as long as we're doing this because I can start to use grouping things in these tags and stuff. I can start to use this in order to um, make something that looks more like a document. And since, uh, and this is actually where I'd prefer for most of my projects that the public documentation live, unless it's a very small project. Um, the reason being that I believe that your inline documentation should be changing at roughly the same rate as your source code. Otherwise, you substantially increase the risk of it going stale. Um, you still have that risk a little bit, but it's much, much mitigated if you're, you're mostly, if your comments and your source are very tightly bound and they're changing at the same rate. Um, now, public API does not change at the same rate as my source files because changing the public API is making a breaking change. That's a major version upgrade. What does change at the same rate as my public API are my unit tests. Um, so not for every single project. There are, there are times when I would not want to do this, but... For many of my projects, for projects like Distilled, I would like my public API to be documented next to my unit tests, not in my main source file. Um, now, Distilled, I'm going to take this to the extreme, and I'm actually going to use my unit tests as public documentation. Um, but let's let's go through and make that. So let's say we've got then, and let's say uh, 
that's the suite that we're testing. Um, we want to talk a little bit about the then method. And I'm not going to go much in detail here because the point of this is to show off the documentation, not the thing being documented. So I might say something like um, the then method allows you to have callbacks when a suite finishes. All right, cool. Let's say that that's the entire thing. Um, so this is kind of like a one-liner. So since we're talking about syntax, what if we put this all on one line? So that would be equivalent. I mean, let's well, let's do this one step at a time. This is my original documentation right here. Um, I talked about this before, and I think it's a really good idea. You should be able to say this, um, which is, OK, this is an ID. And any text after the ID just gets embedded into the same block. Um, and that's just going to be space separated. So if I had a string here, what I'd get back as text from this would look like a string here, the then method, etc. cetera. Um, and I could also just keep on extending text after this. But basically, well, maybe you put this. I'm not sure exactly how that would get attached. But the, the point being that it seems to make a lot of sense that you should be able to have one line comments. Um, so you could have this. And one of the ways you could have one line comments is you basically say, OK, I started a comment block here. But this is a line, the first line up here. So I can also just do that. Uh, and the way that we handle that, we're already handling this. Uh, we throw out blank lines. Um, we throw out lines that have zero prefixes. So if this was just a new line character, it would get thrown out. So this is the same documentation as this. They're both the same thing. So now I have a random block here that all of my tests are going to get attached to. So I want to talk a little bit more about the basic method. Now I can just attach this. Remember how um, remember how sort of linking things to these uh, shared nodes works. I can just uh, attach my block down here to anything that has an index. Um, if it there is no index, like if I put in like an at deprecated here, there is no in there is no uh, a node that has at deprecated as its ID. So that'll get created at compile time. But um, if it already exists, it just gets attached. So now I can start to have these hierarchies, which is kind of fun. Uh, and we can say basic overview up here, something like that. Um, and here's where stuff gets interesting because now I want to start pulling the source out. And the way I'd like to be able to do that is by doing this. I'm probably only going to check for one of these characters. I'm probably going to allow you to do this. Um, but, oh, actually, I can't do that. I'd have to check for two of them. Huh. Uh, well, all right, let's cross that bridge later. For right now, let's just say that you put that in. Or maybe you don't just check for the first character. Maybe you allow any type of string to be passed in here. That's easy enough to do. So what this should do is take all of the text in between these two comment blocks, and that should become a text node. So this allows me to literally pull my source out into the documentation. 
Uh, that's very, very powerful. Now this is also a text node, so I should be able to say at example inside here. Um, so this is now a text node, and like all of these will be treated like lines of unmarked down text. I guess there'd be some sort of like literal text or something. Um, so let's say that I wanted to full-fledged just embed this into something. Like I wanted to, I don't want to do any fancy filtering. I just want like to use this as part of something else. So this text node stuff still exists. So I can still come in here and be like, here is an example. Um, and in markdown, anything between these tags gets treated as literal. I'm not sure you should be required to do that. Hmm. Yeah, well, who knows how markdown will work anyway. Um, but down at the bottom, yeah, let's say that I'm parsing this into markdown. I can then come down here and be like, close off this block and be like, here's the rest of, uh, here's some extra text about the example. And what that should get parsed into is literally this code stuck between these two lines of text. All of it should get formatted as markdown. All of it should be a comment. Um, probably at that point, I would want to stick this down here. Be like example, maybe I give it its own name and say here, uh, example one, or the basic method. So this is number one, is this idea that I should be able to include parts of my source code inside my documentation. Um, nobody right now allows me to do this, and any of the documentation generators allows me to have this level of control of just ripping the source out. There's a couple of things that try to, but they don't do very well. Um, so that's number one, and we'll come back to what makes this kind of interesting and challenging from an implementation standpoint. But let's follow it up with the second thing that I want to be able to do, which is, let's say that I'm not doing that. Let's say that I'm like, okay, at, um, then, and this is an at, um, Here's some stuff to do uh, to show off. And down here, I'm not extracting out the source at this point, but I want to like continue. I want to have my comments next to my code, like right next to my code. So down here, I want to have like an extra note about something and be like, um, Here's some, let's, let's talk about this. Then we'll always fire off. So let's, let's actually write that stuff out. Then we'll always fire off, no matter what. And I can actually come down here and put in a plus sign instead of another star. And what a plus sign means is, oh, whatever the last block of text that you were parsing was, this just goes back on top of it. Um, Basically, I'm saying, okay, skip until you get to this plus sign and just continue from there. So I can now do like a multi-line, then we'll always fire off no matter what. Um, it will fire off if the tests pass. It will fire off if the tests fail. Um, it will even fire off for children that are skipped. Uh, 
Um, so what that will end up parsing down to in literal text is a block that is attached to at then. And it will say, then will always fire off no matter what. It will fire off if tests pass. It will fire off if tests fail. So you get the idea that what this allows me to do is basically split my comments between multiple lines. Um, both of these are very, very important to me. Um, absolutely necessary for a documentation generator, I think. Um, at least one that I want to use. Um, they make parsing a little bit more complicated, though. So let's um, let's just undo everything in here. Uh, just revert the file. Cool. Uh, okay, I wanted to. All right, whatever. Can I just check out this? Can I just check out? There we go. Uh, from just develop. Cool. Cool. Okay. So let's jump back and talk about why this is complicated. Because um, parsing the source is now a stateful operation. Um, so before, you could just take a list of comments and you didn't have to care about anything. You, you could just parse them individually on their own. There was a little bit of state involved in that you had to keep track of the indexes. But there wasn't a huge amount of state involved. Um, each comment could basically be parsed individually. Well, now something like this actually looks different. Um, so if I want to say, if I want to have a very complicated to do in my at in my org mode setup, and I stick this in, and I say at to do. I don't even, I can do this as a one-liner. All right, I keep on forgetting that this syntax is something that I'm going to eventually support. So I can do at to do. Um, this needs to be refactored out into some kind of helper utility via block type. So right now, and I close this off down here. So now we got a stateful operation because the first one of these that gets hit is creating a new text block. The second one that gets hit is closing that text block. So depending on whether I've started one or, or if I'm in a text block, suddenly I have to worry about that. Additionally, we have this. So let's say I go down to here and I say, oh, oh, wait, I wanted something else. So now I need to, again, I need to be tracking the previous text block because um, I need to be able to do append text to the end of it. Uh, so this in itself is a kind of stateful operation. I want this to be extensible, but I'm not so worried about it being extensible. Like, I'm probably not going to expose an API for this, at least not at first. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see how things get cre end, up, end up going. Um, that's certainly more stateful. than um, the line types. So the fact that we support an at to do, the fact that we re support, uh, or th the fact that we support linking and the fact that we support IDs, both of those are line types and there will likely be other line types in the future. Uh, some of them will be like, take this line and parse it as markdown. Some of them will be like, one thing I've thought about that I'm not going to be doing anytime soon, probably, unless I change my mind within the next like day and a half, is it would be kind of cool to have lines inside my documentation generator that I can execute 
like that would be kind of interesting. Suppose I could do something like console dot or return or even even something else. Suppose I could be like ten plus five. And that would get executed as a line of JavaScript. And the result of it, what it returns, would then get parsed back into text. There's some really interesting stuff that you could theoretically do of, do with that. Especially if it has some kind of reference to the text that already exists. Um, I'm not going to deal with that. More extensible. You, you start to, to, to go down a very deep hole with this. Because you're suddenly like, well... Couldn't I be like block? Like, couldn't I define a function in here, and then couldn't I call it later? It would be kind of nice to do that, and then be like, that's kind of powerful, but it's also potentially very confusing, and maybe. Maybe it's too confusing. Maybe it's like too much. Maybe it's too powerful. Um, maybe it's not powerful enough. Like maybe what you'd like to be able to do even more than that is like have some kind of this binding or like have some sort of global object or something that get, gets called in the same ton context. So you could be like return node text or something like that that would actually be past the contents of the text up to here. So maybe you want it to be even more powerful. Maybe you'd want to go like crazy. And I have no idea how this would actually work. Um, this is not something I'm looking into right now, but maybe you'd want to go completely crazy and you would want this to, you would want this to be able to um, call on your file you'd want it to be able to basically say like if you had so so if you had some sort of uh parsing of your syntax tree here and you could do something close to run this code maybe you could do operations on it not on the code itself but maybe your code could do operations on the documentation and and that sounds super confusing. So let me clarify exactly what I mean by that. Is like suppose you had var x equals constants or var constants equals and you had like a equals 5 b equals 10 whatever. So you've got some object in here that you want to expose to your documentation. So there are a lot of documentation generators that will try to parse this for you. Um, and this is dangerous, and I'm not sure exactly how it would work. But, but like, if you could do something like constants or object.keys constants, And maybe at that point you maybe at that point it wouldn't be enough for an entire line. Maybe at that point you'd want to have a block. And you'd you'd want this to be called like in the same context and you'd be like, well, for each key return plus this is one of the keys like maybe you'd want something as powerful as this which I don't really know how this would work um, I'm not even remotely looking to build this right now um, but what this would do basically is it would take that constants code it would run it and then it would run your code in the same context and then you'd pull that out and you'd return a string and that would become your documentation. So this would spit out, A, this is one of the keys. B, this is one of the keys. Um, that would be 
insanely powerful if it actually worked. Um, it also might have a whole bunch of drawbacks. The point of this is that what I'm building right now is not necessarily the final state only thing that could exist. So especially for line types, especially for comment types and stuff, I'm not necessarily looking at exposing an API and letting people write their own stuff. That might be overkill, actually. Um, I think you have to be a little bit careful when you start doing that kind of thing. But I do want it to be something that at the very least I can come back to and start messing around with and playing with. Um, and that means that in addition to it being this sort of stateful operation, um, it has to be a kind of extensible, like I don't just want to stick a switch statement in here. Although, I don't know, maybe that's what you end up with. Huh. So that's a lot of descriptions and not much actual code. Um, so let's actually put together a separate view into this. First of all, let's make sure that I didn't mess anything up that my tests still actually pass. Yeah, OK, good. Um, and I'll come back and deal with that later. Um, Secondly, let's put together a second view into this. Let's delete you. Okay. And let's start actually making some utils for this. Now, is this something that I want to be separated out probably um i mean there's a couple of things i'm gonna need i'm gonna need a reference to the source itself um because when this gets hit when these two comments get hit it's not enough to just have a reference to the comments i need to be able to look at the source um so right off the bat this needs this node factory needs to be given the source source It's going to need to have a reference to the previous blocks. Um, or at least the previous block, non-plural. It's going to need to have a reference to just those two things, actually. But, but passing those into, I'm not going to separate things out into separate utilities just because I can. Like, I'm not going to separate things out into, into secondary utilities just because, like, oh, this could go in another block of code. Like, it needs to be, like, an actual pipeline. It needs to be an actual API. Um, otherwise, there's no point in me not just leaving it in the middle of this file. Um, that's a separate conversation, but it is not actually always a good idea to just randomly split your code into multiple functions. Um, sometimes it's actually a very bad idea. Um, like this is kind of, I also have to think about the types of stuff that I'll want to do in the future. This utility for building a block is going to need to call into this utility for parsing a line. And parsing the line itself is going to need to have a reference to, I guess, not the source, but it's definitely going to need to have a reference to the node, at least. So we basically have some kind of like operation that you're performing on a node.
Um, we want to be able to handle defaults. So something like this works, but something like this right now with the current way this is coded, this will blow up. This will not actually get parsed uh, because it needs to start with that prefix. So by default, if it can't find an existing prefix, it should assume that it has no prefix and it should just parse it as a literal line of text. We don't want to do the markdown conversion at that point. In fact, we may not want to do the markdown conversion at all. We may just want to pass you out blank text because you're eventually going to be consolidating this into a single file and just calling markdown on the, the entire file, most likely. So probably star just means string literal. Probably. Yeah, prob probably star just means string literal. Um, and I need to rethink how much of this JSON type stuff I want to work with and how I want to work with it because, quite specifically because, um, I want this to be something that can be serialized into pure JSON. And like already... With the type of stuff I'm doing through the Node API, um, you'll get circular dependencies or circular references, and uh, then they don't parse out. And then you can't do J JSON, and then you can't pass it into stuff like Emacs. You can't pass it into your console output. You can't. It has to live in JavaScript at that point. So we definitely don't want to give up some of the nice conveniences of the structure right now but we want it to be like maybe we can take it and parse it out into something else but maybe that doesn't have an impact on the actual lines themselves like parse line could basically just take a string and nothing else And then we have build block, but like, okay, so now things get dumb. We're passing in the source. We're passing in the node or, or the graph, I guess. And we're passing in more than that. Like we need to pass in comment information. Like the, the node needs to be semi-created at this point because part of the act of, of making the node, so it's, we've got to pass in the comment itself. Like, not, we're not passing a node. We're like, okay, build a block from this comment. And by the way, here's a source and a graph. Um, and at that point, like, there's no point in that being a separate function. Other than, I guess, it makes testing it a tiny bit easier. But it makes readability worse to have that be a separate function. Um, unless I'm going to abstract out a little bit of this stuff. A tiny bit of this stuff, basically, so that, um, like, if you, if we had a graph object or something like that, if we said var graph equals graph, and we gave the graph a, a source and comments, but see, like, that's kind of weird. It's like, why wouldn't you just give it comments at that point? What's the point? If you're giving it source and you have a comment that you're going to iterate over, like, why Why is this singular? Like, if I am going to... If I am going to provide you with a mechanism to serialize your graph into strict JSON, i.e. JSON that you can serve in purely a text format that's not a JavaScript object, that's something that you can just pipe out through a console, that you can send an arrest request, whatever you want to do. If I am going to provide you with a mechanism to do that, then there is no reason why I can't take advantage 
of the full scope of JavaScript in the graph that isn't parsed. So right now I have this graph with circular references. It's got the previous and next thing. I I don't maybe that's not circular references, whatever. But certainly once we get IDs in and linking things between each other, that's going to be a circular reference. So at that point, like graph should be made up of nodes, which is great. Like, yeah, you should have nodes, but nodes should have like methods just attached to them, whatever. Like, let's just stick these things on a prototype chain. In fact, that would make serialization a great deal easier because you could go through and call like serialize on every single node and get out a well-formatted JSON object. You could turn your documentation into a number of different structures depending on what you really want. And in JavaScript, in JavaScript you might have a lot of control. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I do know, actually. Yeah. I do think that we want to have nodes with methods attached to them. We want to be able to have overall methods attached to our graph. We want to be able to, say, build a block. We maybe don't want that to be in a separate module. Maybe we want it to be, like, right here. Like, if you're building a graph, you can just pass in the source, and then you could be like, var node equals graph dot node. And just pass it in a, a comment. That ties it really stinking heavily to this idea of... Um, it ties it very, very heavily to Acorn, um, which is an unnecessary language-dependent operation. Um, there's no reason. Well, now that we've gotten rid of classes and functions and all of that stuff, we're not language-specific at this point. I mean, we, we are, but there, we don't have to be, so we shouldn't tie ourselves directly to JavaScript. I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to think about this, and then I'll be uh, right back with another one of these.